Okay. All right. The recording has started. So welcome again, everyone. Um, I know there's a few people still trickling into the room, but we'll get started now. Um, um, new building. New building. <clears throat> And just another reminder, if you if you could please mute your microphones um, when entering the room, that would be much appreciated. Okay, so um, I would just like to start us off with a land acknowledgement and I know we're all joining uh, likely from from different uh, different places, um, but I will provide a land acknowledgement um, that's centered on uh, where I am joining from, which is Toronto. So I live and work on stolen Indigenous land in what is currently known as Toronto. And Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and is also part of the traditional territories of other Anishinaabe peoples, as well as the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat. And as a settler who has benefited from the rich resources of this stolen land, I affirm my responsibility to actively dismantle settler colonialism, materially redress its harms, and support the rematriation of land to Indigenous peoples here and around the world. Okay. And I would also like to introduce our ASL interpreter for today, Adele. And also note that we do have live captioning um, available uh, as an option. So you can turn that on if you wish. All right. So with all of that out of the way, I will hand things over to Chris Beasley uh, to get us started and uh, introduce this session. All right. Thank you, Nick. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Beasley. I am the CEO at Community Living Ontario. It's my pleasure today to introduce Today's session and today's speaker, Brad Saunders, who is the CEO at Community Living Toronto. Community Living Toronto is celebrating its 75th anniversary, 75 years of belonging. I can assure you Brad has not been around that long, either as CEO or on this earth. Brad's gonna be talking about innovative housing, but I feel like it could be, it could be called taking inventory of your assets and leveraging them. Mm -hmm. but, but I think that's probably too long a name. So we'll, we'll, stick with, uh, we'll stick with Brad's title. What When we think about the physical assets, the collaborations, the relationships, the opportunities that present themselves and the social capital that we all have in various forms uh, and leveraging those in this case towards um, inclusive, housing in our communities. That's really what we're all about. And Brad's got some interesting things that Community Living Toronto has been doing uh, right up until the current redevelopment of their Lawson project uh, in Scarborough, Ontario. Anyway, with that, I will hand it over to Brad. Brad, thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. And you're right, I'm not older than 75 years, but uh, some mornings it feels that way. Uh, really glad to be here this morning um, and uh, excited about this project that I want to share with you that we've started to talk about in the last couple of weeks uh, that Community Living Toronto has undertaken. We've been at this a number of years and we'll get that in, into that uh, 
uh, over the next number of minutes. Got a lot of time for questions and answers. Really want people to ask whatever they want. Uh, no questions off limits. We're figuring out some of this as we go and really looking to involve uh, as many people from our uh, our community and our developmental services community as well as we as we undertake this project. So maybe Julia, I'll get you to start sharing the slide deck and we can jump right into this. So um, this is, uh, we're going to cover a bit of ground. Most of you know what Community Living Toronto does. It's the same types of programs and services that, uh, that many of us do. So, but we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this particular housing approach and then the Lawson project uh, in, in particular. Um, a number, next slide, please. The next, uh, uh, this is a sort of content. And I, I got to say, we're adapting a generic slide deck that we use for a number of uh, uh, pieces. So there'll be some stuff in here that will be very familiar to you. So you're, you're, you're familiar with the state of developmental services in Ontario. Next slide, please. I think it's interesting to note that uh, uh, we have done a couple of projects over the years about uh, uh, with the city of Toronto around homelessness. And one of the things we learned was that uh, although the prevalence rate for developmental disability in Ontario is around 1%, between 18 uh, and 30% of people in the shelter system in Toronto anyway, uh, have a developmental disability that is often undiagnosed. And as we know, 75% of people uh, live in poverty. There's also 15,000 plus people waiting for residential service. So it's within that context that we're, that we're coming with this housing, uh, housing project. Community Living Toronto is quite large. We support about 807 people where they live, and that's a real range of supports. So about half that number live in traditional group uh, care, uh, where between sort of three and five people might live uh, together. Most of the people in those supports require 24-7 care. So our sense is that most of the people that are receiving 24-7, they're not over-supported, uh, although there is always the, those, uh, those cases, and these housing models sort of get at that. We also have a range beyond just group care of uh, SIL and individualized, including self-managed uh, funding, including our LIGHTS programs, which supports about 50 individuals where families are hiring their own staff with money that is uh, provided directly to them. We also have SIL and complex care, uh, complex support models, including people with medically fragile, medically intensive conditions, and those with uh, behaviors that challenge. Next slide, please. So we're right across the city uh, with about 80 locations. Um, and we, what we found was, as we've grown over the years, that one of the challenges we faced was there's a need for less traditional housing, sort of, if you think of Toronto and many of our suburbs, uh, particularly, we have a large footprint in uh, North York and Scarborough. It's sort of uh, detached or semi-detached homes in residential neighborhoods. But Toronto, as you will know, and we've all seen, is really evolving. If you look at those pictures from sort of the CN Tower from 1977 to 1997, up to 2007 and beyond, uh, you can see the number of uh, uh, residential condo buildings that have gone up. Uh, there's been more and more of those large uh, buildings, which forced us as an organization to decide if we're gonna stay relevant, if we're gonna continue to provide residential supports, then we need to evolve our model. Next slide, please. Our supported living, currently we have 44, 45 homes uh, and uh, uh, again, spread across the city. We've also developed what we're calling, what we've called the cluster support model within about 11 buildings. Um, there, there are, uh, and we'll get into that model a little bit further. Um, we, in addition to people that are directly supportive of us with housing, we're also involved, as many of you are, through our APSW program and our family support uh, program around supporting individuals living on their own or who may be inappropriately housed or, uh, or homeless uh, or living with families. So the need goes quite beyond the people that we're actually supporting in, uh, in our residential services. So I want to introduce you next to Ralph to give you an idea of a couple of ranges, a couple of people who are impacted by this. So Ralph um, came with us. We did a launch in Ottawa last uh, last week, and Ralph was one of two people that joined us to talk about his experience of 
moving into an apartment on his own. Uh, Ralph joined Community Living Toronto at the age of 15 residentially. Uh, and after going through many years of foster care in the child welfare system, and Ralph has been gracious enough to allow me to share his story. He's quite happy to talk about it himself um, and uh, is, it wants more people to know about the journey that he's gone on, uh, gone through. Uh, when he came to Community Living Toronto, he moved into a group home that was in Scarborough and he lived there for about five years. Then when he became a transitional age youth, uh, left a children's home and went into another program that we, that we operate, also residential, had a room of his own and sort of a lower level apartment with another roommate. Uh, he, he stayed there for about seven years until this past October when he moved into a location at Treddy Way. So Treddy Way is a new build uh, that's near sort of, uh, sort of uh, Yorkdale, so uh, in the Wilson uh, Dufferin uh, area. He has, Ralph has lived with roommates his entire life. And what he's most proud about is being able to have his own space, his own washroom, very happy about having laundry facilities in his apartment. Uh, and he's now sort of fit into that community. He goes to church regularly, takes the TTC there. He likes going to Yorkdale when he needs stuff. He really sort of fits into, uh, into, that, uh, into that community. And the way we've structured our supports is that he's living alone, but there are other people in that building who might have a roommate, might have uh, two other roommates where, and there might be a staff team that's based out of that. Uh, apartment. And as needed, Ralph knows that he can go down a few floors to get support if he needs it. And then people will check on him uh, during the day to help with specific issues or on a regular schedule or just to drop by and, uh, and check in to see how he's doing. So he's living independently, but he really feels he's got a hand, uh, um, uh, a hand available to help if, uh, if needed. So the next slide um, is uh, where we're going to try showing a video and these we'll see if this I won't give any commentary let's see if the video works but this is Biagio's apartment also in the same uh, in the same uh, building there that Ralph is in wow, you're I got the wow <laughs> thank you Biagio welcome to see, see uh, the kitchen thank you the stove uh-huh So that's Biagio's apartment, and, and he obviously lives with a roommate. This video was taken soon after he moved in. So we're the, the, there's not a lot of furnishings in there, but that's something that people furnish their own suites. They uh, purchase their own TVs, do that kind of thing, uh, and we, we support them with this. We've got a number of locations around the city that we've moved into and done this model in and that are being built. So uh, back in 2012, 2012, we started with a location with Toronto Community Housing Corporation on Dan Leckie Way. Dan Leckie Way is just off uh, Bremner, which is just down the street from the Sky Dome. Great building, uh, centrally located, quite a community. This was our first foray into this, where we moved people from group homes, residential homes in the neighbor in, uh, in the community, into their own suites. And again, a mix of bachelor, one bedroom, two bedroom, and then up to four bedrooms. Uh, where, and the four bedroom units would be people that need 24-7 um, type supports and staff are always based there. But those units tend to serve as a hub. Since then, we've gone into the West Onlands where we have 13 suites. And that's a seniors focused building that we uh, we have with also with Toronto Community Housing. Uh, in 2019, we did the Madison. We sort of moved in uh, just before COVID hit. And that was... Uh, 
Uh, that's a really nice uh, building just up the street, just down the street from Casa Loma. And then Treddy Way earlier, later in 2022. And then we our next uh, project is opening at Birchmount Green, which is uh, Birchmount and Lawrence. Uh, and we have 31 suites there. We tend to have between five and 10% uh, of the building mix. And depending on who's building, the, there's a mix of people there. So as an example, Birchmount Green has a number of community organizations, uh, including mental health organizations, domestic violence uh, um, organizations, and others that provide a variety of supports, including many of these organizations, of the uh, builds that we're in, it's affordable housing. So there's uh, people that might be on the Toronto Community Housing Wait List or qualify for uh, for supports from the City of Toronto as well. We've got a couple of, uh, here's just some pictures. Mervish Village, which is at Bathurst and Bloor, uh, which is the rebuilt Honest Ed site. We've got a number of rentals. That whole development is a rental uh, site, I believe. And we've got a couple of units there. And then, as I mentioned, the Birchmount Green site, uh, Birchmount Green site here as well. So now our Lawson project. So a bit of a bit of background. Um, we uh, the, the the building opened. It was actually a school building that opened in 1963. And in that time, the thinking was you would want a residential component. Uh, thinking has obviously evolved, and I don't know that it was residential. Uh, um, many people lived there for very often for very long. It was, uh, but but it was a school for for very many years. And Community Living Toronto used to have back in the day in the 60s and 70s, arrangements with the school board that we would often co-own locations uh, with them. So we had a number spread around the city. As we, as sort of inclusion and that expectation fell more and more to the school boards, the partnerships with organizations like Community Living Toronto backed away uh, and the schools took over the sites. We were able to keep hold on to this site. We provided uh, respite and day supports there. It was also some administrative space. Uh, and we bought the building back in 2009. Uh, and I think it's worth noting that the board at the time, although we didn't see an immediate need and we didn't have a lot of extra money, the board thought strategically long-term, this would be a good investment for us. So I, I give a lot of credit to the people that made those choices, you know, 10, 15 years ago to say the timing isn't right, but this could become something uh, down the road. It's for, next slide, it's uh, 4.7 acres. Uh, and this is what we're hoping to do, uh, not hoping to do, we're planning to do with uh, Tridel over the next sort of eight to 10 years um, to build an inclusive neighborhood development that is uh, energy efficient and environmentally friendly, uh, has very accessible. And the idea is, is creating an accessible and inclusive community. This location is about 100 yards from where the current uh, TTC subway expansion is in Scarborough. There's been a lot of talk over the last couple of decades around the Scarborough uh, subway, and it's right at our doorstep here. Uh, we are also turning part of the place, part of the facility into a uh, public park. The plan is for, so if you look at the bottom left corner, which is called sort of block four by that public park, you can see the outline of a building. That will be the Community Living Toronto building and we will own that land and that building. We will be financing it with uh, a grant and loans from the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation through the National Housing Strategy. Uh, it will be about 28 stories, uh, which again will be a mix of, uh, of individuals we support, people that need affordable housing. And then there'll be about half the building will be um, market rents. The other four towers will be built in phases. And this is where the interesting part of what we're doing kind of comes in and that we're, we're doing a partnership with uh, Tridel. So Tridel is one of Canada's uh, largest condo developers. Uh, and we're setting up a, we're entering into partnership with them where we're not just selling them the land, but we're developing it jointly. We have obviously a lesser stake in that development than Tridel does, but we still do benefit financially. The reason we structured it that way is it matters to us what that community looks like uh, over the next 10, 20, 50 years. We recognize that people are going to be raising families there. We're going to be, uh, have a presence on site. 
uh, for decades to come. We wanted to make sure that we were influencing the design, the layout, uh, how things look and felt, uh, and had an influence and a presence uh, as, we, as we go forward. Our rental building will, as I at this point, and nothing's approved yet, but what we're proposing to the city is 280 units of affordable rental. And this, the third bullet point here, we talk about 20% of the individuals that live in our rental building will be individuals either supported by or uh, connected with the developmental services uh, sector. We're trying to find a balance as we do this between making an impact uh, and inclusion. And by impact, I mean we want to make sure that the that uh, that with with thousands of people waiting, we didn't want to do a ten year project and open two apartments uh, to meet sort of the one percent inclusion threshold, so it just mirrors other or other neighborhoods around the city. We wanted to make sure that we could provide enough housing that it actually makes a difference in people's lives in the city of Toronto waiting for service. Um, but we also want to make sure that it wasn't uh, so there wasn't such an overrepresentation of people with developmental disabilities that it would become uh, so much more noticeable and just a place that revolved around disabilities. We wanted to build a neighborhood. The, that's the inclusion piece of it. We want to make sure that we're providing safe, inclusive, welcoming communities, not just for people with disabilities, but uh, for, for the whole community. We've also, because we're designing it, we get to build in some perks or features that we'd like, including garden suites for some of the individuals we support that are medically complex. Um, we've got an inclusive park there. We plan to do accessibility features beyond just the minimal building code requirements. We also have the podium there, as you can see, the sort of uh, graphics, or there'll be uh, a range of commercial and community event space as well. I won't get into too much of the benefits here, but again, we are, we've been in these communities for a long time. It's important reputationally that we continue to be well represented and provide nice places for people to live. Uh, so again, there'll be a mix of tenure um, in the rental building, in the condominium buildings that we're doing with Tridel. Uh, in each of those four buildings, we will have the option of buying up to 20% of the units before they're built. And again, with the same idea of developing, doing, having some impact, but also uh, making sure that we're, uh, we're inclusive in our design. We're gonna be funding that through the National Housing Strategy. And they're working on what they're calling a checkerboard funding model, where you can get, cause we don't want like a floor dedicated to people we support or different organizations. We wanna make sure that the buildings, oh, like a checkerboard, that uh, units that we're occupying are spread throughout the entire development. Um, I'll just wrap up by saying a couple things uh, uh, around advocacy. This, th there's, there's been a real um, flood, I will say, of housing, especially in Toronto and some of the GTA area, Greater Toronto area, uh, around development of new housing. The, the folks that have typically moved in for, in our situation anyway, have been people from existing residential programs, um, people coming off ALC and hospital, or TAYs. So transitional age youth and people needing alternative level of care. Uh, what we've done is have people move from group care that we've known well for years and we're looking for a change that we could accommodate. And then with our vacant homes, we've repurposed them for people that might need more, more, uh, uh, more support. What that doesn't get at is the thousands of people that are waiting for residential service uh, and are worried about the future. So a big advocacy priority for us as the housing comes online is that ministry, other levels of government step up and start funding the supports needed for supportive housing. Because housing is just housing, and it can very easily just become another vacant unit that can be filled uh, and occupied by anybody. We're also doing a lot of advocacy, this checkerboard strategy with the national housing, uh, the national housing strategy to make sure that that works not only for us, but for other organizations across, uh, across the country. 
it, we really feel it will change the dynamic when you come in as an organization that is uh, doing housing, uh, but you're not coming and saying, can you give us a couple of units or you know, we'll work something out, but coming and saying, look, we want to buy 4%, 5%, 10% of your whole project uh, out of the gate, and you change your relationship from being somebody wanting to purchase a unit down the road to actually investing uh, in the projects before they get started. That's the vision that we've got. What we've, what I've learned about um, a housing project is that until 70% of the units are sold, uh, project construction can't begin. So the, if you, and uh, condominium developers have investors that get them as close as they can to that 70% out of the gate. So this idea of changing that relationship from the receiver of service to investing in housing uh, that will benefit, help get the project going and benefit community, we think is a, is a good shift. Um, we're also doing, we're in the midst now, anybody that's done building, we're, we're doing the rounds with our neighbors and a community. We've been there a long time. Neighbors are very interested in what we're doing and making sure that, um, that, uh, Harold Lawson and that the, the legacy that's been on site there, uh, on being on site there remains. I'll finally, just before, um, turning it back to Chris, uh, I'll say this idea of inclusion and belonging. We've picked 20%. Uh, of the number of units, um, uh, the percentage of which we will we will occupy for ourselves as an organization, we'll work out if other if we partner with other organizations or how we manage uh, that and what the tenure will look like, who owns units and how we sort of retain that housing stock going forward, if that makes sense. But we don't know that that's the right number. But we did consultations early on, and we had a whole range of uh, of suggestions. We haven't found a lot, even around the world, of similar types of projects. So uh, we're we're starting with this. We think it's we're comfortable with this number uh, going now, but certainly open uh, open to debates and and people's uh, thoughts on that. Um, I think that's it. I will say I'm happy to speak to anyone uh, one on one. We're happy to uh, attend board meetings and. Uh, uh, and share our experience and encourage people or give any consultation that that people would find helpful. And just to, to end on this note, I, I mentioned earlier that our board made a decision about a decade ago or more to hold on to the property that we had uh, for this opportunity. And over that decade, and uh, maybe Julia, we can drop the drop the slide deck at this point. But um, over that decade, um, the Scarborough built up. So there used to be no condominiums in Scarborough. You moved to Scarborough to get a detached home uh, in a neighborhood. But in the last 10, 15 years, there's been more and more uh, condominium buildings and larger towers go up in that neighborhood. So now we're not standing apart. And instead of building some townhouses 15 years ago, now we're able to do something much, uh, much more ambitious. And I, again, I'll give our board and our volunteer board members a lot of credit for taking some risk, both financially uh, and reputationally, to hold on to something and and uh, and see what could come of it, as opposed to just doing something quick and expedient. So, I, we all, you know, all of us uh, in the Community Living Ontario movement are governed by volunteer boards of directors, and these can be heady and expensive things to get around. And when we're build, bringing proposals that are you know tens and even hundreds of millions of dollars in scale, and all of our scales are different. I, I certainly get that. It can be a little much for a volunteer board to go, oh my goodness, that's uh, that's a lot of money to put on the line and a lot of risk. But uh, I do think that there is opportunity and we should be pursuing those things as they uh, as they present ourselves. So if you've got land, really worth looking into. If you've got partnerships with churches or long-term care facilities or a local legion and they've got land, lots of opportunity there to develop. Uh, they are only about a third of the way towards reaching the National Housing Strategy target of 2,400 units for people with developmental disabilities across this across the country. So lots of room there to grow. Anyway, I'll stop there. And Chris, I think I'm turning it back to you. Thanks, Brad. That's uh, yeah, that was that was fantastic. And uh, just uh, I was part of that board a decade ago that uh, voted. So uh, that's my one claim to fame, and I'll take it. <laughs> Uh, really appreciate hearing your, your comments and bringing us up to date on some of the things that Community Living Toronto has been doing. Um, you know, and it, 
I guess with the loss and redevelopment sort of brought the conversation to the fore for a lot of people and, you know, getting a lot of questions about, well, what, what is this? What will it look like? You know, is it congregated, segregated? What, what exactly is this? And so, you know, Brad, to his credit, said, uh, you know, I said, we need, let's hear it from the horse's mouth. And he, uh, he put himself out there and is really open to and wanting to hear comments and questions from, from you folks here today. So uh, I think, Nick, if you're able to moderate or see or read some of the questions and uh, facilitate that, we'll, uh, we'll get right into that. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I think probably the best way to go about this, I, I see there are a few questions in the chat already. Um, so that's that's one option for folks if they want to uh, leave a question in the chat, then we can try to get to those. Um, you can also use the raise hand function, which you should be able to find under reactions um, on sort of the, uh, the toolbar that should be on the bottom of your screen. So again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to leave them in the chat or use the raise hand function and then we can uh, call on you uh, to ask your question. So maybe because there's already some questions in the chat, I'll just start there. Um, so I see a question from David who asks, how does a disabled adult become part of this process? Sure, it's a good, good question and we're working on that. So um, we will send, we will have a registry where people can sign up to get email updates and that. We've got a process that we've got to go through with the city around planning and approvals and zoning. So we won't be breaking ground for another three to four years. And in the next couple of years, we'll be doing a lot of consultations. So uh, stay tuned. Our website is the place to go. And there'll be a, a list where people can sign up for to get email blasts. And we'll keep people informed as they come. All right. Great. Thanks for that answer, Brad. Um, so we have another question. Are there units for people who are not developmentally challenged? If so, could you please tell us more? Are the units all rental or some purchase slash condo uh, income dependent? 20% uh, developmentally challenged. Those with exceptional needs, waiting list. Sure. So uh, I, I think I covered some of this, but I'll, I'll just um, go over it again. And then, Anne, if you've got any questions, you can follow up in the chat. But so, yes, it will be a mix. 20% of, of the units will be designated for people that... in. So there's two projects, two parts of this, right? The rental building, which is 28 stories. We think it'll be 280 units, plus or minus, depending on city approvals. 20% of those will be for people we support or people with a disability. We haven't quite sorted out that mix yet. The rest will be uh, sort of the 30% will be for people that need affordable housing uh, and with a range of affordability in there. And again, there, I won't get into this, but there's a whole piece around affordability and deeply affordable and uh, how, how that uh, there's calculations that go into that. And then 50% of the, of the rental will just be market rate, which again, these are numbers that are set by CMHC in terms of determining your, your costs. So there will be a mix. Um, the income dependent piece, we're, I don't have an answer for that uh, for that uh, yet. And we don't have a waiting list yet. We're just getting started, but we are starting to get questions like this, which would lead him to, to believe there will be a, uh, uh, a wait list or lots of people, lots of people interested. When we did our consultation, some families were asking, can I buy a condo and then buy a condo for my adult child so that I know they're like, we're, you know, we might grow up to, uh, age together uh, within the same kind of neighborhood, knowing that there's supports available, but they might have their own unit. So that's what some people are starting to think about. We That would certainly be an opportunity. Um, but all those scenarios we'll, we'll sort out and just, uh, work through as we go through this over the next few years. All right, and uh, another question 
from the chat, uh, which I, I think you've maybe sort of answered already, but is it possible for a person who could use the Community Living Toronto supports to purchase a condo or are they only available for rental? Is there a mailing list to join to stay in the loop on the project? Right, so the community living building will be uh, rental suites uh, and then the condos. So anybody can buy the, the condos that come for sale in the Tridell building, but we will, has, uh, we will have as of right, the opportunity to buy 20% of those units uh, and mo more details on that still need to be worked out. Okay, I don't see any more. I don't see any hands up yet, but there are lots of questions coming in through the chat. So the next chat question, uh, given that only current group, uh, I think group home residents are the ones moving into these vertical communities, what are the specific plans and difficulties for Community Living Toronto to also move people um, on SIL to sure. these vertical communities as well? Sure, and I probably I probably did say that, but may not have spoken as clearly as I should have. It's not just individuals in in group uh, homes. We have moved a number of people that were uh, in apartments in situations that were a little tenuous, maybe not a great neighborhood, and they didn't like uh, or for whatever reason. So, uh, people from a number of our residential supports have moved into the vertical communities, uh, the cluster model that we've been that we've been supporting. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm just reading some of these other questions. Um, so, yeah, Rajni asked a question, but I'm 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 wondering if maybe it would be helpful. Um, again, this this session uh, is being recorded, and so if you uh, missed some of the information earlier um, or or kind of want um, to uh, to take in that information later this this will be available later as a recording um, yeah and and Nick just so and the, the the question was around step by step around how you go through doing this it uh, I wish I could it's extremely complicated we've got consultants and lawyers and stuff that we've been working with that we can recommend you to. We can walk through high level what the steps are, but it, it's it's a it is a big undertaking. There's no no question uh, about that. But again, happy to talk about that offline. All right, and yeah, so, so I know we have a lot of questions coming in, uh, Brad. I'm wondering if maybe you want to identify. Sure, I'll, I'll just go through. Sure, I'll just go through. So. Uh, Don is asking, I think we cover this, people coming off the DSO wait list. That is a big motivator for us, right? Around there's so many people waiting for housing um, and, uh, and supports. Uh, the ministry, I think what we need to do as a sector is come around, come together around some advocacy around expanding the supports that are available residentially for individuals uh, with a developmental disability. Um, there's a lot of parents that are aging and worried about the future of their their sons and daughters people are are have been waiting for many many years and very few new uh, residential placements come online in the course of a year i think government needs to step up and start funding residential supports whatever they look like we don't we don't have to get into what that looks like but they do need to they you know there was a budget two weeks ago and they talked about adding 3,000 new hospital beds and 8,000 or 30,000 new long-term care beds. And, uh, you know, they they make that as a point of pride. Did not once mention our sector or adding any more supports into the sector. And I think we should just stop accepting that as being all right. Uh, it's probably a collaborative advocacy effort that we need to do. Uh, the question around rent subsidies, rent subsidies are separate and apart from what we're getting from the national housing strategy. Won't know until closer to when they open, but our certainly our intent is to have rent subsidies in the building we do build and some of our, our vertical communities also have rent subsidies. 
question around what's the best way to approach or find a builder um, to be part of this idea. It, it's, uh, we, with, we've done it a couple ways where we know of people or you meet people through affordable housing projects that might be happening in your city. And we've developed relationships with uh, one builder in particular that's building our Birchmount Green site. Um, uh, just, you know, you click with people. We worked with them quite closely. We made sure that whenever he needed something or uh, needed support, we were there within, you know, right away, uh, enthusiastically supporting that. He's become a good ally. With the, with the Tridel partnership, we did a, a, a select, an, inv an invited bid uh, to a few vendors and they were the successful ones. So there's different ways of going at that. My thinking is always start with your network and start talking with people in your community, people in your boards, chamber of commerce, uh, that type of thing. Uh, the website address, yeah, so Tom's got that, Finland, Toronto. Um, are there some staff on site in one of the units go to people 24 seven, how does that work? So that, those are the three or four bedroom units where there, there is a staff on site similar to what we would be doing in a, in a group home. So staff have shifts that they're working. We don't, we have overnight awake staff. Um, so staff would be based out of that building, out of that unit. Uh, and then they would either be doing, uh, going from that unit into checking on other people or doing parts of their shift in other units. Or they would, or people would come to them and they'd know that there'd be somebody there 24 seven. One of the pieces that we learned getting into this is that you need to work with your condo board or your building management. When you have staff roaming through the building at three o'clock in the morning, one of our early builds was a senior build uh, where we had eight or 10 units or something. And uh, they were not thrilled with having people wandering up and down the stairwells and that. So it took a while to, to get used to, but uh, lesson lesson learned. Does Ottawa have equivalent housing options for those who have high functioning autism but need supportive housing? We live in Ottawa, though I am originally from Toronto. I'm not sure. I know there's a lot of stuff going on in, in Ottawa. Uh, certainly the National Housing Strategy um, program would apply in Ottawa. I, I just don't know uh, what's going on there. Chris, you may have more insight into that. Well, certainly know that, you know, Tamir is, is interested in developing some land that they have similar to what you have, Brad, at uh, the Lawson site, and how do they create, um, you know, accessible, affordable housing for the people they support, as well as, um, as you're doing, being part of the broader community and, and connecting with, um, with the community more as a whole. So they're, they're looking at a similar type of thing and just uh, considering how they how they might again leverage leverage their assets, connect with the national housing housing strategy, connect with the city around what the needs are, and uh, and how to create again a, a development in, on a similar basis. But I'm sure there are others out there. I I, they, I don't know offhand either. Again, I'm too Toronto centric apparently. <laughs> uh, there's a question around places I recommended around to find land to develop. So start with what you own. Um, and it could be a quite a small piece. We've got some small properties that as we get into this, we're starting to look at doing more, um, uh, you know, smaller builds, four or five, eight stories, stuff like that. Uh, I had mentioned churches uh, as one. Lots of churches have shrinking congregations want to maintain a presence in a community and often have some in, some land uh, in buildings that tend to be very old. Uh, there, I, I'm aware of at least half a dozen churches right now going through similar builds and they often have uh, a commitment to community. So whether you have a connection or outreach and approach churches around doing that, that might be something to try. Legions are the other one that I've heard success. I don't or hear, heard suggested. I don't know of any legions that have done this, but I often a legion, again, old building, big parking lot, put the parking underground, build residential up, uh, and again, um, gives them a new building that they've got tenure in and gives community, you know, the opportunity to address some of the housing pressures. 
Are we planning anything in Etobicoke? Not on our own, but there is, uh, we're working with the Learning Enrichment Foundation. They're doing some projects there. And, uh, but it, it, the way Toronto plays out, there's not a lot of affordable housing going up in the West End for whatever reason, but uh, we are certainly open to looking there. Uh, is there a timeline for completion of the condos by Tridel? We expect to break ground in anywhere between two and four years. Uh, the build is about, uh, you know, up to a couple of years, and then we'll do in phases. A lot of this has to do with how fast we can sell uh, condominiums, but we expect the whole project to take between eight to 10 years before it's completed. Um, have you found that this cluster model allows you to cut back on the number of staff support needed to support a large number of individuals? Um, no, we have not found that this is a way to save money on staffing. Uh, although I, you know, as you're suggesting, you would, th you would think conceptually that it might be, uh, we, we haven't found that, that it's been a, a, a saver there. It's a different kind of support that you're providing, but we weren't, we didn't find that we were able to save, um, to save on FTEs. I don't, so question about Mississauga. I don't know what's of any projects in Mississauga, but, uh, others may. Uh, and then yes, Tamir in uh, in Ottawa. That's another organization that uh, is doing some some work in Ottawa as well. So, all right. Um, yeah. Again, I don't see any hands up. Um, there was one question a bit earlier in the chat that um, that maybe we can uh, we can try to get to since we we do have some time. Um, so Tina asked. Um, so thank you for sharing. Uh, one, is there pressure from partners in government or other local service providers to increase the occupancy beyond the five to 10% and within one setting, 20%? And then two, is there any information sharing media approaches to support this thinking that others may consider using? So is there pressure? Um, I would say no. The nice thing about these things is we're doing it. It's our money. It's our time. We're, we, we're sort of setting parameters. So I'm not aware of any sort of pressure we've had to, uh, to increase. And people are quite sensitive to, as has Tridel been quite sensitive to, the, again, this idea of impact and inclusion and finding a number that works for us. So haven't experienced uh, that. And what, what was the part B of that question? Sorry, Nick. I, yeah, so part two was, uh, is there any information sharing media no. approaches to support this thinking that others may consider using? Sure. So uh, we, we did a, some press releases on our website. You can you can look those up and then we're happy if you want to reach out to uh, to myself or Petronella and I'll get Julia to throw up our contact slide just so you uh, take our email addresses, phone numbers down. Feel free to email call. Like I said, we're we're uh really proud of this initiative and uh, um uh and where we're at and where it's going so we're happy to speak to anybody uh anytime and uh and support and encourage others around doing something uh similar all right fantastic uh does anyone else have any other questions for Brad? Okay. Um, all right, so as I said before, this will be um, available as a recording later on. Um, so if you, if you did miss part of the presentation or, or wanna go back over some parts of it, um uh, don't don't worry this will be made available and um uh chris were you gonna close things out yeah thanks nick again just a shout out to brad for uh for being uh willing to do this and uh and uh putting himself out there again there's there's probably more questions than answers at this point but i think the the takeaway for me at least is you know, this is this is about inspiring possibilities, right? It's what what might we consider? Who do we know? How do we leverage? How do we connect? 
Um, and it's not to say, you know, if you're in Ingersoll and you're watching this and you go, well, sure, Toronto, thousands of units, right? What about Ingersoll? It could be five units, one of which you're going to support someone in, but you might have a skin in that where you could do it in the in that building where you can use the rents from the other three or four units to subsidize the one where you're supporting or to su subsidize others in other situations. So revenue models, the potential there, the idea of, you know, whether it's a synagogue or a mosque or a church or a legion, or what are the community assets that are out there in your community? Who can you connect to? Who do you and your board know? How do you, what's government doing? And how do you start connecting those dots to, to do, um, to create affordable, uh, accessible, supported housing for the people we care about? in the broader community, right? We don't, we don't want the special places for special people, but we can be a big part of the solution for what is an, an all of community issue. Doesn't matter if you're a single person, family, professionals, students, seniors, people with disabilities, there's a shortage of housing. How can, we have assets, we have experience, we have uh, we have sometimes land in, in the case of Community Living Toronto. We have relationships. We have ability to bring people together because we've been doing it for, you know, many, many decades. So if we can leverage that, and if it's Mississauga, what does Community Living Mississauga know? Who do they know? What are they doing? Ask, right? Reach out, connect with, get involved. And I think there's there's lots of questions, but there's also solutions out there. So. Again, thanks to everyone for being here today. Really helpful in some of uh, the questions that have been asked. Um, as I said, more questions and answers, but really appreciate um, what Brad and his board and Community Living Toronto uh, are doing. And um, so keep up the great work. And uh, to all of you, thanks for, for attending and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, thanks, everyone. everyone. And thanks, Adele, for the interpreting. Well done. <laughs>